Hello Dana, welcome. Arya, hello, thank you for joining. Uh, we are gonna wait for a couple of minutes until we reach a limited time of no number of audi uh, audiences. خب یه مقدار سب کنیم یه چند نفری به اون اضافه بشن بعد شروع میکنیم شد اوکی okay. We are still waiting for more audiences to join us Uh, Donna, just to let you know, uh, I'm going to speak Persian for a couple of minutes and I'm going to introduce uh, Austin to uh, Persian audiences, then uh, uh, I will now change my language and start speaking English. Oh, Eddie, thanks for joining, it's my pleasure. Eddie, I'm going to speak Persian for a couple of minutes at the beginning, then uh, we are going to start speaking English and carry on the uh, session oh Austin hi thanks for joining I look forward to intervie interviewing you and hosting you but as I told you before I'm gonna speak uh, Persian for a couple of minutes at the beginning of the uh, live to inform the Persian audiences خدمت همون که به همون اضافه شدن خیلی لطف که این تشریف رو بردین من در ابتدای لایف یه مقدار فارسی صحبت میکنم که هم آسین رو معرفی کنم و همین که روند لایف رو بگم که اصلا به چه صورته و برای چی داریم این کارا رو میکنیم و بعد شروع میکنیم آسین رو دعوت میکنم و اینترویو رو با آسین شروع خواهیم کرد خب من یه توضیح بدم کلا راجع به این لایف بچه که توی در واقع اساتی دیگه توی این لایو به مدارن اضافه میشن Uh, کسایی هم که توی دنیا از روی آسیب نوازندگی فعالیت زیادی داشتن و میشه گفت متخصص هم توی این زمینه حالا هر کدومشون روی کرده مختلفی دارن ما داریم تلاش میکنیم هر هفته uh, یکی از در واقع کسایی که توی این زمینه uh, چیز هستن متخصص هستن و دعوت کنیم با روی کرده افراد مختلف آشنا بشیم و بتونیم uh, یه در واقع تبادل اطلاعاتی داشته باشیم من با من نمنده میوز ماستر اینجا صحبت خواهم کرد و اونا رو میزبانی میکنم که بتونیم تبادل اطلاعات داشته باشیم از اطلاعات هم دیگه استفاده کنیم و در کل بتونیم موزیسیان ها رو نسبت به شرایطی که باش درگیر هستن و آسیبا و درده که تجربه میکنن در واقع مطالعهشون کنیم و بهشون کمک کنیم که از این آسیبا جلوگیری کننده اول اول که خب خیلی اهمیت داره یا اگر که در مراحل ابتداییش هستن بتونن کاری بکنن که به مراحل حادتر نرسه و جلوش رو بگیرن که بازم به نظر من میشه پیشگیری اگر تو مراحل اولیه باشه اما اگر خدای نکرد تو مراحل جدی و حادش هستن بتونن که در واقع راه کرده ای که روی کرده ای که کمک میکنه به این قضیه رو پیدا کنن و ازش استفاده کنن ما اینجا روی کرده مختلف در واقع معرفی میکنیم همه روی کرده نقاط مثبت خودشون رو دارن همشون قابل احترام و همش از همشون خیلی چیز میشه یاد گرفت توی نظر خود من اینه که ما باید روی کرده مختلف رو بدونیم راجعشون اطلاعات داشته باشیم و تلاش کنیم که از همشون توی حالت مختلف استفاده کنیم چون هر کدوم شه سه نقاط مثبت دارن که توی یه سری از جاها قاعدتا به درد مخانه خورد همینا من یه معرفی هم راجع به آسین انجام بدم آسین دکترا نوازندگی از دانشگاه ایندیانا داره از امریکاست به ما اضافه میشه امشب نوازنده بسیار خوب محقق و دوره ها سرتیفیکیت های زیادی داره پرسونال ترینر هستش یعنی به صورت شخصی با افراد روی در واقع اصلاح حرکتی و تغذیه و آسیبای نوازندگی و همه اینا کار میکنه بسیار هم شناخته شده است توی امریکا دامن در واقع میشه گفت که کامیونیتی بزرگی داره به افراد زیادی در ارتباطه بعد 
تو خب تو طول این مسیرش که داشته به سمت حرفه شدن و دکتر نوازندگی میرفته خب تجربات زیادی داره هم روی آسیبای نوازندگی و حالا هم روی نوازنده بادی برنجی که ما ازش خیلی استفاده خواهیم کرد ما شب دعوتش که این اطلاعاتش با ما در میون بذاره من راجع به خودش میپرسم در ابتدای ماجر را ازش میپرسم که اصلا چرا چی شد که به این قضیه علاقه من شد و چه جوری پیش رفت یعنی چه دورایی گذرون تا به اینجا رسید و با ترجمه که دکترای نوازندگی داره از امریکا خیلی منطقه ای که ما راجع به مثلا لیسانس فوق لیسانس و حتی دکترا بپرسیم که روی کرده ای که در رابطه با آسیبای نوازندگی است آیا تو این دوره ها تو این دورای تحصیلی هست یا نه چون بالاخره داره تو بهترین دانشگاه دنیا درس میخونه دیگه باید چک کنیم ببینیم که این قضیه تو جای مختلف دنیا چه جوری داره نسبت بهش در واقع اکثر عمل نشون داده میشه و راه حلایی که میدن چیه من همسرم یا سمان با ما سوالایی که دارید رو می نویسه بعد از این ور برای من میفرسه من روی چیز روی لپتاپ می خونم ترجمه می کنم به انگلیسی از آسی می پرسم و حالا در آخر لایف یه تیکه کوتی های دوباره فارسی صحبت می کنم و بهتون جوابش رو می گم بی زحمت تمام سوالاتون رو فارسی بنویسین که یا سمان برای من فوروارد کنه اینجا همین دیگه بریم سراغ این که آسین رو دعوت کنیم و ببینیم چه جوریه اوکی بچه من دیگه زبان رو تغییر میدم به انگلیسی چون باید مخاطبه انگلیسی رو دعوت کنیم اوکی آسین I'm going to send you a request and please join us Do you see it on your screen? Hey, Hello. Ahmed. How's it going, man? Thank you. Thank you. How are you? Thanks for joining. Oh, of course. My pleasure. Thanks for contacting me and setting this all up. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Me too. It's my honor. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, I'm sure today you have a lot to uh, you know, share with us. And uh, I myself, I'm going to learn a lot from you. <laughs> well, we're going to learn from each other. I can't wait to have this conversation and hear your ideas as well and uh, see where that leads us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Asin, uh, please introduce yourself for our audiences. Sure. Hey, everybody. My name is Austin Pansner. I'm the CEO and founder of The Functional Musician, where we help classically trained musicians holistically perform without pain. And I got into health and wellness about um, four or five years ago. And I'm also a doctoral student at Indiana University in Trombone. And during my studies, during my master's degree in performance diploma, I ended up uh, injuring myself quite a bit. I had an injury cycle lasting three years. It all started with blowing out my forearm when I switched to bass trombone. It developed to my back. It developed to my shoulders. And it took me a while to get over. And, you know, honestly, like looking back, um, I'm really lucky and fortunate to have gotten past that point because there were a lot of times where I wanted to quit. There were, uh, you know, just those negative thoughts can really just plant those seeds of um, negativity and they can sprout into a tree that would that just makes you want to ultimately give up and pursue something else. So um, along those lines, I was um, searching for ways to fix my problem. And I was also searching for things to do uh, if I stopped doing music altogether. And I've always been like a health and wellness nut. I mean, I've been working out since I was 18, 17. I was involved in sports and high school and middle school. So I always um, knew the benefits of exercise and physical health and wellness. And I started pursuing pers personal training, corrective exercise. I learned more about uh, nutrition through precision nutrition. And I started applying all these concepts to myself, uh, to my life, um, just to, you know, practice what I preach mentality. And I actually found that a lot of these habits, a lot of these concepts that I was um, utilizing in my own life were helping me get over the barriers that stood in between my way of getting over these obstacles. So I started seeing that and I started to get, I started to get that little glimpse of hope, right? That little glimmer of hope and that little glimmer of hope motivated me to um, push to the point to where we are today. And I think um, if I were to do a live performance today, it would mark two and a half years of performing without pain. And 
Um, my first recital in my doctoral degree did not go well. I actually ended up one of those injuries was like a week before my recital and my recital did not go well. I could not take a breath without feeling a stabbing sensation in my chest. But fast forward a year later, I was able to perform without pain. And I was like, okay, I'm, I think I'm on the right track here. I think um, I'm making progress. Let's see if I can keep doing these good things. And I've been keeping this up and trying to develop this mentality of injury prevention and what that means. And that's how the functional musician came to fruition. That's how it came to be developed. So uh, in the world where uh, health and wellness in the musician world is so um, rare, I mean, preventative health is, is unfortunately not where it needs to be in the musical world. So with that said, like, you know, my generation and other people are really trying to put this at the forefront of um, social media and just trying to get people aware that health and wellness is an important thing that we need to start considering in our life or else we're going to be going down the path towards injury. And that's eventually going to stop us from growing. It's going to stop us from performing sometime down the road whether that's, um, you know, in a couple years or in 30 years, you know, it all depends on the person. It all depends on the situation, but basically that's my story. So the shortened version. So, you know, like I said earlier, it's really, really awesome to be here and have this conversation with you, Hamid. So thank you for putting this together. And if anybody ever has any questions during this Instagram live, feel free to just post them below and I'll try to get to them in a timely fashion. Okay, thank you, Austin, for uh, your detailed information uh, and your wonderful story. Thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, in fact, about the questions, my wife is going to write them and send them to me. I, I'm going to ask them at the end of the session, is, if it's okay for you. Yep. Is it? Yeah, that sounds great. Yes, it's okay. Okay, uh, you said that uh, you haven't practiced music since 18, if I'm right, yes? I'm sorry, can you say that again? I heard that you said you started practicing uh, trombone at the, from the time that you were 18, yes? Oh, oh, no, no, no. I've been practicing health and wellness since the time I was 18. I've actually been playing trombone since I was, uh, I think, 10 or 11. I forget how old I was, but I started playing in sixth grade. Uh-huh. And uh, you used to, uh, actually, at that time, you were playing the bass trombone? Uh, no, I was playing the tenor trombone. I switched to bass um, back in 2000 and. 15 2016 oh a couple of years ago yes yeah four or five years ago i switched to bass trombone going from my master's yes. degree to a performance diploma okay can you just uh, let us know what happened about the injury now you are really uh, knowledgeable about, us, about this field and let us know what happened the, the injury that you said is it started here and then just uh, you know uh, go through your body what happened Sure. Yeah. So the first injury I got, I switched to bass trombone. And for those trombonists out there, um, basically I had it set up. Someone had a bass trombone for sale. I had a lot of opportunities at IU and it was the same bass trombone model as my tenor, except it was a bass trombone. So I switched to it and I didn't know it wasn't that heavy to me. It was probably was what, like a pound, a pound and a half, two pounds heavier. And due to all these opportunities at IU, I was playing an orchestra. I was playing a jazz band. Um, I was in a chamber ensemble, I was in a brass quintet, and I was also pursuing auditions on the side. And if you combine that with, you know, your daily fundamental routine, that's so important for brass players, and also the demands from your teacher, I was playing anywhere from eight to 10 hours a day. And yeah, so it, uh, my chops were able to hold up somehow. Well, that's a, that's a miracle in itself. But it was like a week or two into it. I'm like, holy crap, I'm getting like a lot of tension and pain in my forearms. And I saw it coming and I did whatever I could to try to manage that. But because I was playing eight to 10 hours a day, no matter what I did, the preventative um, exercises and preventative concepts that I was doing was not enough. And a month in, like I was just in the middle of jazz band, I was playing a lick and all of a sudden, boom, like something happened in my arm and I couldn't hold up my bass trombone anymore. So I kind of freaked out. Um, it's all I could think about for two hours. That was the longest two hours of my life. And um, I ended up, I, you know, I don't, it was very, it was, it was hard. I, I, you know, I freaked out for like a hot minute, you know, it was probably about a week or so. I was, my mind was just racing a million times a minute because I didn't know what to do. So I ended up settling with, um, I tried all these different ergonomic devices for my instrument and I ended up settling with something called the Ergobone. And for those of you that don't play trombone, it's basically like a bipod for your instrument. 
like um, it's like a rod that you put on the put on your instrument and you're able to put it on your seat or connect it to your chest so you don't have to hold up all of that weight with your forearms or your hands and I played that for about six months and um, it was really you know I made it work there were a lot of limitations um, and I wasn't able to grow as much as I did but I didn't have to take time away from my horn I didn't have to take time away from school and I didn't have to take a break so that was a blessing in itself um, so it took me about six seven almost eight months to get over that um, that forearm injury before I could pick up my trombone without pain again. And even when I did that, I still had to build up. Like I could only hold it for probably three to five minutes at a time uh, when I was weaning myself off of that ergonomic device. Um, but I got it up to a point where I was practicing a lot again. And I think I got up to about two hours, um, not all at once, of course, spread out throughout the day. And then I ended up injuring uh, my shoulders. Uh, I tore a rotator cuff in my left rotator and looking back, I mean, it's all interconnected. I mean, um, I, I injured my forearm. And why did I injure my forearm? Well, I was holding up this heavy instrument. And I was basically like, this is kind of interesting. So I was basically using uh, these two fingers to hold up my entire trombone. And because these two fingers aren't meant to hold up that heavy of an instrument for a prolonged period of time, uh, those muscles stopped working. So where did that go? I transferred up my arm into my forearm. So my forearm started taking on all of that load of my bass trombone. Now I blew out my forearm and I got to a point where I could hold up my trombone again, but I still wasn't understanding. Like I, I was treating the symptom. I wasn't treating the whole. So I ended up blowing out my shoulder. So what really ended up happening is I was like, okay, I took the weight off of my fingers. I took the weight off of my forearm, but that load has to go somewhere. So I ended up going to my shoulder and I didn't have, sho I didn't have shoulder strength developed enough to hold up a bass trombone either. And nor should our shoulders hold up the bass trombone. They're not meant to. So just looking back, I mean, it all stemmed from a posture related um, injury. I mean, that and my muscles in my back weren't actually stabilizing holding up the trombone. So I was relying on different muscles to hold up an instrument that should have been supported by other muscles. So as you can imagine, I mean, it just kept going up the arm until eventually my third injury was my back. And that's because I didn't have my back muscles developed and my uh, scapula winged. So they opened up. I had rounded shoulders and uh, my body, my upper body was just a mess. So as you can imagine, if you're doing any kind of weightlifting, if you're lifting anything or you do a repetitive movement for a long period of time, if you don't have good form, if you don't have the proper muscles developed and you aren't aware of those two things, you open yourself up to a greater risk of injury. And that's just kept what happening. Um, my foundation was crumbling before me because I had no foundation. I was relying on uh, short-term solutions to hold up my trombone. So, sorry, that's a very complicated and long answer to your question, but I hope that gives you a little bit of insight to kind of how that stemmed. So, I mean, it just went up my arm, forearm, shoulder, and then my back. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing your story honestly with us. It was wonderful. Uh, I myself, I was, I was picturing the situation. I was coming with you step by step. And... Uh, just to know, how much does a bass trombone weigh? Um, I mean, bass trombone weighs, they, they vary. I've um, tested trombone, bass trombones that weigh like three and a half pounds. I think mine weighs about four and a half. And then um, there are other makers that make heavier bass trombones that can go anywhere from, you know, five pounds to possibly eight pounds. I don't know because I haven't weighed those heavy instruments, but it is a notable difference um, from a tenor trombone, which weighs about anywhere from like, one and a half if you're going super super lightweight all the way up to three three and a half or four so it, it has about oh. it has about an average of two pounds depending on the maker so if it's the same maker yeah. it'll be you know around two pounds heavier than their tenor trombone therefore you are carrying that way for uh eight hours per day yes yeah we do those small muscles yeah 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 so as you can imagine it's just like it was down, bound to happen one way or another, whether it was a month or two months or three months. It's just a matter of time. Yes, you cannot believe that. It's, uh, you know, it's unbelievable. It's the only thing that I can say. And uh, what, uh, what approaches did you actually uh, pursue after, uh, you know, getting the injury? What did you do after that? 
Yeah, well, I was researching in a lot of rehabilitative care. So once you get injured, um, basically what you have to do is you have to rehab, you have to rehabilitate. And I call that rehabilitative care. And um, what I was really looking for was like, well, rehabilitative care is great. Um, I was getting rehab. I saw a personal trainer, or not a personal trainer. I saw a physical therapist. I saw massage therapists. Uh, I saw a lot of doctors. I got a lot of opinions on my playing. Some po- told me to take rest. Some told me to stop playing. But the physical therapist that I worked with at Indiana University was uh, at the Performing Arts Medicine um, School was uh, very supportive. And that kind of helped me get back to square one. But my whole the whole thing I was like questioning is like, well, we have all of these rehabilitative care options, right? Why don't we have these preventative care options? That's what we really, really need um, because we don't want to be injured in the first place. Um, So I think what we did is we kind of looked at, you know, over the past 50 years, looking at musician health and wellness, we did a great job of being like, Hey, let's help, help out our injured musicians. Um, But we should have been questioning like, why is this happening to begin with? What options do we have to prevent this outcome from happening? So um, what I was do- what I did was I researched all of the certifications available. I researched uh, everything that was out there. I considered getting a degree in kinesthesiology at IU. I considered going into athletic training. I considered going into sports science. Um, I considered a lot of different routes. And ultimately what really, what it came down to is I loved to perform. I loved to teach. I wasn't willing to sacrifice that in order to spend 80 hours studying sports science a week. So what I did was I went to the National Academy of Sports Medicine online and got their personal trainer certification with the idea that I would follow that up with their corrective exercise certification. And that's really what I was, what I was interested in. But the corrective exercise certification, uh, you need a prerequisite of the personal training and some type of other certification or accredited uh, body of uh, sports medicine. So um, I went into the idea with that and I thought I, I'd be like, okay, I can shell this out in six months, but it is so much information. So it actually took me a couple years to get to that point. But when I got to that degree, when I got to that certification, I started studying for it. I knew I was like, yes, this is like exactly what these two years have been leading up to. And I got the personal or the precision nutrition certification because um, I'm very conscious about what I eat. I'm very conscious about, Uh, what we put in our bodies. They say you are what you eat and you you essentially are. What you put into your body is energy and there are varying degrees of um, nutritional values we can put into our body. So I got that actually just because I was curious. I wanted to know more about the body. I wanted to know more about how food affects the body. And actually all of these health and wellness certifications really blend together and connect in a lot of different ways. So I'm very grateful that I kind of went that direction. And little did I know that those three certifications would like form this triangle that is the foundation of like the knowledge that I base my programs off of. So um, from that standpoint, it was really just like two, two things, man. Like I was looking for one, a way to pursue something outside of music in case I was going to drop out of school because I was burnt out. I was tired of dealing with an injury. It was so stressful. It was uh, mentally draining, physically draining. I lost hope. Um, and it, it just, the, the despair and the negativity and the enjoyment of life was just so low. And I'm the type of person who I'm a happy dude. Like I like to live life. I like to, um, pursue things that I like to do. And I like to be happy. Like if you're not happy in this life and friend doing what you love, then what's the point? So, uh, I wasn't enjoying music, so I was looking at it from that stance. But at the same time, I was also thinking like, well, if I do figure this out, like if I get these certifications, I will be able to help other musicians down the road. And um, in that in that thinking, it was like very, very little. I was like, okay, there's like a 10% chance like I'm going to get past this injury. And there's like a 90% chance I'm going to drop out of school and become a personal trainer and help people live healthy lives. But, um, you know, fast forward to now, you know, I was able to get over that injury. And that's how those certifications led to the functional musician. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And thank you for uh, actually talking about the nutrition, because I myself and amuse myself we really believe that nutrition is uh, really important and uh, plays a, an important role, you know, in our lives and in our uh, instrument playing. Asim, uh, do you have me? Uh, I lost your picture. Okay. okay. You got me? Because, Can you see uh, me? Yes, yes, I have. Cool. Uh, 
a big part in music muscle, we believe that musicians are athletes of small muscles. So uh, as an special, uh, as a professional athlete, you know, you have to take care about your nutrition, about your diet, about your rest. Uh, everything is like, an, you know, a professional athlete. And uh, we really believe that it plays a great role in our uh, musical journey. Uh, okay, just let us know about nutrition and its in impact on musicians' uh, journey. Yeah, sure. So um, we can look at it from a lot of different angles, right? Um, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit. But basically, one of the things that I preach um, from a holistic standpoint are daily foundational health and wellness habits, right? And one of those is nutrition. And I want to take a look at it from, um, let's take a look at it from a bigger perspective and then niche down to brass players. So if we look at nutrition from every musician's standpoint, right? If you are what you eat, if you are um, if your diet regularly consists of highly processed foods, uh, highly carbonated drinks that are filled with sugar, um, or are very high in saturated fats, we open ourselves up to um, a lot of potential diseases down the road, such as heart disease, diabetes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also, just from an energy standpoint, being a musician, we have to, especially when you're in school, you have to balance so many obligations, and it's almost set up in, in a way where, like, you can't do everything at your opti the level that you want to. You have to sacrifice in one area in order to uh, raise up another. And along those lines, if you don't have the mental energy and the physical energy, energy to uh, support the amount of stuff you have to do in a day, it can be very, very hard and very, very mentally and physically draining to accomplish that. For example, like those days where I was playing eight to 10 hours a day due to jazz band, orchestra, chamber ensemble, and auditions and gigs and um, uh, teacher obligations and expectations, I was also taking music theory. I was taking music history. I was taking sight singing. And um, I tried to limit the amount of classes I took every semester because that's a lot. But if, as you can imagine, if you're already playing eight to 10 hours a day and you have to get eight hours of sleep, that's eight other hours where I'm either spending in class, doing homework, studying, tr score studying, or trying to improve on my craft in one way or another. So if you, um, f from a nutritional sense, if you can strategically um, implement a nutritional strategy where you're very conscious about what you eat, you eat highly nutritious foods that are rich in nutrients, and you eat foods that are easily digestible, you're going to be able to have a lot more mental focus throughout the day, you're going to be able to have a lot more physical focus throughout the day. If you go and eat a pizza for lunch, you're going to want to take a nap in the afternoon, your mind's going to feel a little bit foggy, you're going to feel uh, not as motivated to do a lot of things. However, if you go, you eat a, you know, a chicken salad with some fresh fruit, some almonds, not only are you going to feel more full in the long run, but you're going to have a lot more mental, uh, it, mental and physical energy, you know, like 10 minutes after you eat, you're like, you know what, I don't feel like 100% full. I don't feel gross. I feel ready. Like, let's go do this thing. And that's not something a lot of musicians think about because when we're in those situations where we're balancing just 18 hours of things that we have to do, you know, with our obligations and expectations, it can be very easy to be like, I don't need to eat. I don't need to eat lunch. I'm going to sacrifice my lunch hour and study a little bit. I'm going to sacrifice this hour of sleep in order to get another practice session in. I'm going to sacrifice my physical exercise in order to practice or study more or go to rehearsal. It's, you know, it's a constant cycle. And if we get in the cycle, that's when we run the risk of opening ourselves up to a lot of these different um, mental and physical in injuries that I talk about. Um, so that's from like a very, very broad general perspective, just to develop the energy, both mentally and physically to help you perform at your highest throughout the day. And, you know, Tom, I'd love to talk about the specifics of being a brass player with nutrition. I think it's important. Is that okay, Hamid? Yes. 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 Cool. All right. So. Brass players. Okay. We are going to get back to this one and at the end of the position, if it's okay with you. All right, cool. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Uh, one thing that you said, uh, unfortunately, musicians uh, sacrifice different things for their, you know, 
professional life because uh, as a musician we all know that the courses that we have to cover even uh, during our study uh, or even the time that we are at home for example imagine if, I, if i'm an employee i go to the uh, you know office and i come back the rest of the day is uh, i can you know take care of my body but when i'm a musician uh, the time that i'm in my i'm in the school i'm practicing the time that i come home i have to practice more to be ready for the tomorrow okay and we are sacrificing many things uh, we don't really pay attention to our nutrition to our rest to our breaks and we just you no know, play say okay if i play this one as you mentioned i can progress for example this level i can go there or i can go there and it never stops you know we can go to the moon and come back and there's no stop for musician because the knowledge that we need is really broad and uh, we need a lot of time to cover that and uh, one important thing that you mentioned was about the food uh, the digestible food yes they are really important and uh, we all have experienced it then you have a you know heavy meal uh, you don't feel like doing anything you know you just want to lay down and rest for you know for hours maybe uh and uh, as you mentioned is uh, not really good for musicians and because uh, mm -hmm. they need uh, you know blood pressure to be uh, here in their these small muscles so when you have a heavy meal uh, all the uh, blood circulation uh, is going to go to here and try to digest the food so uh, the circulation that comes to your small muscle of course are going to be really uh, no uh, say a uh, slow in uh, uh, and uh, not much you know and uh, one more important thing that uh, i noticed uh, during our conversation was you drinking water uh, let me just drink water as well you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah cheers cheers because <laughs> i've seen musician uh, that never you know drink water and when you tell them okay do you drink water during your day say so, no it's okay the, uh, when i have a coffee or uh, i have my food okay that's uh, i have a carbonated drink and it's the drink and say no you need water your body needs water to operate well yes and if you're a brass player if you're not hydrated your chops actually respond differently than when you're hydrated your your lips are yes. going to swell more the blood can't flow to the lips as efficiently your body is actually working more when it's dehydrated to do normal tasks than if you were if you were hydrated and if the whole idea of playing an instrument is to play as efficiently with as little effort as possible being dehydrated yeah. actually sets you back a block and you're not playing you're not yeah. you're playing against that I'm glad you mentioned yes. that and I'm glad you explained the science behind the nutrition too, how your body, all your energy goes to digesting those heavy foods and your blood pressure starts to rise. I mean, these are all crucial, crucial things that we need to think about. Yes, of course. You know, as a musician, as I told before, like in a professional athlete, we, we have to imagine that we are exercising. Okay, when I have my lunch, uh, after one hour, I have to uh, not do an, uh, practice another session. Okay, I have a practice session. So I have to be ready for that. If I have a heavy meal, of course I cannot uh, get to that. If and if I'm there, my mind is not there. It's crystal clear. We all know that because my mind wants to have a rest, wants to you know, lay down and try to digest the food. And uh, we are just killing it. Okay, play this piece. Play this piece. It's not. Po it's not possible. And we are just killing <laughs> our uh, you no know, muscles because because. Uh, they don't get a good, uh, let's say, signal, and they cannot work work accurately. Right, totally agree. You hit the nail on the head, huh? Yes. Thank you. And uh, uh, you told us that uh, you have a practice and you have uh, got certificate from different approaches and different methods that work on this field. Of course, one of them was. Uh, for uh, a sport uh, and the other one, uh, you mean the personal training. Which one did you uh, uh, find really useful for musicians? Because you have experienced them and you have yeah. knowledge about all of them. It's I mean, just to, I mean, like from a musician standpoint, like if you want to know more information, just how the body works, I would highly recommend um, a sports science um, physiological class, Phys physiological, no, uh, physiology class, right? Um, I did a National Academy of Sports Medicine personal training certification. And what the reason why it took so long was it's basically like, it's basically um, 
how the body works, how it moves, how it operates. I mean, the first two thirds of the book, um, exercise is like not mentioned. It's all about how the human body works and how it moves. So if I could encourage musicians um, from a standpoint, it's not, oh, go study how exercise benefits you. Go study how the human body moves how it works, just, you know, um, learn uh, the different muscle groups, learn the different body systems, learn the different movement systems. And this is actually going to help you more because you're going to be able to connect the dots and you're going to be able to start figuring this out on your own. And then when you go and research it, you're going to be like, oh, that's what that person means. Oh, that's what that person means. Oh, like that's what they mean by squeezing your glutes and bracing your abs or engaging exactly. your trunk. Yeah. So in, all of these different certifications have their own way of teaching with it. And just like with music, where a lot of different teachers may have contrasting ways of saying things, but ultimately they're meaning the same thing. The same thing can be applied to sports science in these personal training certifications. So for me, it was the National Academy of Sports Medicine that really um, helped me in the sense that it was more of a movement certification and more of like a human body certification more than anything. So if you're a musician out there who doesn't know anything or wants to learn more um, or wants to expand their knowledge base, uh, I would highly recommend the National Academy of Sports Medicine personal training. But again, those certifications are quite expensive. So if you are at school and you have these options to have elective credits, why don't you go over to um, the Performing Arts Medicine School or the uh, Sports Science Department and take one of their classes on human movement. That's going to benefit you so much more than going out and getting any one of these certifications out there if you're not wanting to pursue personal training, mobility, or yoga um, in a professional teaching scenario. Would you please uh, tell us um, more about personal training? Yeah, sure. Um, well, for me, personal training, um, hmm. well, there's so many, there's so much I could talk about personal training. So uh, l l let me, let me focus a little bit more. So personal training for me is helping people, you know, I'm a coach and I help people understand their body and I help them reach their goals. So if you came to me and you're like, oh, I'd be like, Hey, Hamid, like, how can I help you? You'd be like, Hey, um, I'd love to take a personal training session um, with you. I, I really want to gain some muscle. I want to gain 10 pounds of muscle, but I also want to lose about 20 pounds. So my job as a personal trainer is to help you get that goal. And that is through nutrition and personal training and personal trainers. You see them all the time at the gyms and there's a wide range of abilities. But for me, being a personal trainer means teaching you about your body, teaching you how it moves, but most importantly, teaching you how to move safely and effectively. It's all about your form and it's all about reaching your goals in a sustainable way. Uh, there are a lot of personal trainers out there who um, uh, go for results. And yeah, results are good. Physiological results are great, but these take time. And if you approach these physiological results with shortcuts, well, ultimately what's going to happen is you're going to fall off the wagon and whatever you lost, whatever you gained, well, like it's 20 pounds of muscle. If you don't have the right habit set in place, you know, your foundation crumbles and you go back to square run. So I used to, I personally trained for about a year, um, six months to a year. It was, it was probably about like 10, 11 months, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's like teaching, it's like teaching trombone. It's like teaching music. It's like teaching a class. Um, it's all about, um, helping other people understand. So, uh, it, it's very inspiring from that way. And that's why I wanted to get into personal training to begin with, because it was a way to teach and way to apply the things that I learned in grad school in a way that's outside of music, but also in a way that can help, um, different people. Does that make sense, Hamid? Thank yes. Yeah, thank you for your detailed information. Uh, do you apply the same approach for musicians? They come to you and they ask you, okay, I want to reach, reach a goal or you, uh, they come to you and say, okay, I, I have a pain here or, uh, for example, I want to stay healthy or I want to get rid of these injuries. How do they uh, actually come to you and ask you about your health? Sure. Well, usually when people come to me, they're experience, they're, they're, it's two things. They're either experiencing tension or pain or has struggled with an injury in the past or um, they want to prevent an injury from happening. Those are like the two scenarios that I most commonly see. Um, as far as aesthetic goals, that's not something that I really deal with anymore. I deal with um, tension and pain in performing without pain because I really believe uh, all of these things are interconnected. So for example, if you are um, an extremely overweight person, but you play a highly physical instrument, such as the 
bass trombone, the tuba, or the violin. Your body is going to be working against what you musically want to do, and ultimately it's going to put a ceiling on your growth. So if uh, um, an overweight violinist came to me and they said, I'm being limited by my body, um, in that case, I would work with them to develop a very systematic goals. They call them SMART goals. Um, and I would work with them in a way that would facilitate that. But most of the time when I'm working with people, um, I, I focus on developing four different things. Okay. First one is daily foundational health and wellness habits, which we talked about hydration, nutrition, and also add in sleep. N number two would be developing body awareness. And that's basically your mind's ability to recognize where tension and pain is at throughout its entire body. Number three, uh, I work on developing and strengthening their body into alignment. So for example, if you are a musician who has rounded shoulders, but you play an instrument where you have to uh, use a lot of your shoulders, such as violin or cello, you're actually putting your shoulders in a very highly compromised position. And down the road, and I'm talking you know, anywhere between three to five to even six, seven years, uh, you're going to start seeing a lot of detrimental effects from the rounded shoulders and constantly putting your shoulders in those positions. Um, and last yes. but not least, uh, we always want to consider um, mindfulness and mindset. Okay. It doesn't matter how much injury prevention you do. If you don't have a mindset that supports the musician you want to be, if you don't have a mindset that supports your sustainable growth, ultimately what's going to hold you back is your mindset and not the injury. So I actually put mindset into an injury because we can have a very negative and toxic uh, mindset when it comes to music music and due to our environments and a lot of outside factors. So um in a way, that is almost an injury that we want to be very, very conscious of. So when a client comes to me with various, various goals, these are the four things I look at. And I find that maybe someone struggles with mindset. And uh, we work on mindset. I may find that I had someone the other day who's like, actually, like, I stay hydrated. I get nine hours of sleep every day. I'm very conscious about what I put in my body. But they never exercised a day in their life. So they had rounded shoulders. So we'd be focusing on developing body awareness and strengthening their body into alignment. And no matter which way I look at it, everybody falls into a different one of these four categories. It's actually quite amazing. And when they fall into these different categories, they all play into each other. And you can quickly see which one is holding someone back. So my goal as a coach, as the function musician coach, is to find which one you're struggling at and make you aware of it. So I'm not the one facilitating the change, but you are. So it's all about you becoming your best teacher and um, me helping you reach their goals. And, you know, nine hours does seem like quite a lot, but, you know, if we're out there 16 hours a day pushing our mind, pushing our body to the limits, I'm going to tell you right now that that's not sustainable. Your mind's going to burn out eventually and your body is going to be like, whoa, man, like slow down. Like your body and your mind are such a beautiful organism. They're two, I would argue they're two separate things. And when they're in, interconnected, um, they're very, very smart. So when you sleep and you naturally wake up nine hours later, uh, that's your body saying, hey, I need to recover. Hey, like I went through a lot that last couple of days. Like, give me a break. You know what I mean? So yes. it's all about listening to those signals and um, letting, letting your body also dictate kind of where, where you're going. So uh, that was a very complex and uh, huge answer for you, Hamid. I hope that was helpful to you and the listeners. I was out of this world. I really appreciate your approach. And the things that you said, the four items, I really want to go through them one by one and talk about them. And I want to put oh, this okay. question aside because that one is uh, more interesting. Uh, the first one, uh, let's go th through. Uh, you said something about daily activities. Uh, our daily activities really you know, affect our musical career. And uh, we are aware of that. Uh, and the things that we try to do, Okay, cheers. Let me. <laughs> yeah. Good job. <laughs> uh, we try to, you know, get a uh, you know, body awareness and uh, we try to understand ourselves and uh, all the time monitoring ourselves about the uh, activities that we are doing. We believe that our uh, daily activities have a great impact on our uh, uh, musical journey. For example, imagine I, I'm a pianist and I'm just you know, playing the piano. When I'm typing, I'm like this, or I'm like this. I'm typing, okay. When I, it goes to the piano, I'm playing like this. It's exactly the same, you know. 
And uh, just imagine, for example, if uh, if I smoke, okay, I get the cigarette like this, okay. Okay, the time that I want to play the flute, my shoulder is here. There is no alignment, so I have lost the alignment, and I have put a lot of strain on this shoulder. So when I play the uh, violin, I say, okay, there is a problem, and uh, I was injured. As, as it, uh, it's not performance-related injuries, but of course it's not, you know. Is because our daily activities. For example, uh, you have seen people. Uh, I'm just doing the dishes. I'm doing uh, the dishes like this. Just look at me. We all do it, you know. Yep. The and shoulders then, rising to the ear. Yes, and we play the guitar. We are exactly the same. Okay, the problem is our daily activities, but because uh, we spend a lot of time playing an instrument, for example, as we said, eight hours, uh, with that posture, that poor posture, can something really have. Oh, no. Uh, I think uh, we lost the connection. Yep. I think, uh, hey, you have I'm sorry. Uh, our internet, we got disconnected there for a second. Uh -huh, okay, okay. And, uh, I was asking you, you usually inform your instrument about the daily activities. Uh, I think, uh, do you hear me? Uh, Hamid, more time. The internet still uh, seems to be... Uh, uh, I think there was a, a problem with the internet. I have to uh, invest in again. Okay. Hey, Hamid, sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, just let me just talk. Okay, okay. Now, can you please speak a little bit to see if we have your voice? Yeah, I can hear you. It's a little fuzzy on um, your, your video, but I can hear what you're saying. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I was asking about uh, the, our daily activities and the way that you inform your students about uh, their daily activities and the, uh, uh, their habits, if they're wrong or if they have to be, you know, better. Do you usually do it with your students? Yeah. Um, so what I do is I actually don't call them daily activities, but I call them foundational health and wellness habits. And what I do is um, I try to look at it very objectively from a holistic standpoint. So I take a step back, I have my student, um, I give my student a checklist or my client a checklist and I just, um, it could have five items on it. All right, let's say sleep, hydration, number of cups of water you drink a day. Um, they write some nutrition things that I ask them about. And then I also ask them about um, their daily habits. Like, um, like, do you participate in yoga or do you do mobility or do you do any stretching, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, my entire goal is to fill in these gaps that my client doesn't have. And it's not enough for me to say, hey, like you need to work on this. 
but it's, you know, really my job to make my, my client aware of why or what they're doing is either beneficial or detrimental to their health. So I don't like to tell clients like you have to do X, you have to do Y or blah, 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 blah. You're going to be injured for life. No, it's more like, um, you know, if you, uh, if you start sacrificing your sleep, you know, your coordination is going to start to suffer. The, the amount of time you can practice a day is going to start to suffer. Um, the amount of skill building and the amount of time your mind has to recover from those practice sessions are going to actually be longer. So from that standpoint, like, is it worth it to sacrifice that one hour of sleep for another practice session if you're sacrificing A, B, C, D, E, F, G um, in your daily life kind of thing? So, you know, we're really looking at these top three. I call it daily health and wellness triangle. That's a terrible triangle, but uh, we're looking at sleep, hydration, and nutrition, right? And all three of these things bleed into each other. And if you neglect one, you're going to start to negatively affect the other. They all bleed into each other in this very holistic way. For example, if you're dehydrated, you're going to affect your sleep. And I would argue sleep is the number one most important health and wellness habit that everybody is willing to sacrifice in order to jumpstart an activity or get ahead um, in their practicing. Yeah, it's also the most fundamental um, health and wellness habit because it allows us to recover from the day. It allows us to process all of these skills and continue to build myelin that allows you to accurately and precisely perform a skill at a higher level. And all of these things uh, we, we, we want to consider. So from a coach standpoint and a client perspective, it's all about helping people build their own sustainable habits so they can become their best self. That's wonderful. That's great. You know, you never tell them what to do. Uh, you just help them to understand what they have to do. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, let's go for the next one for the mind. I think uh, I really like this one. Uh, I've written a couple of uh, essays and articles. Uh, they are uh, also on Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, about the mind, you know, musicians don't really think about their mind, and uh, they they think that okay, playing the music is uh, done by our only by our muscles, and it's a physical activity. Of course, it is, but every physical activity and everything that we do has another side which relates to the mind. Uh, for example, in music, uh, I have seen uh, musicians. For example, uh, they are not in a good mood. Uh, they just had a you know. Uh, argue they are they are not you know really uh, they have a, they don't have a peace of mind and they just uh, start playing uh, and uh, I believe what they are doing at the time is just uh, useless you know there is no uh, destination destination and they are just playing okay I'm just doing that okay uh, what's the uh, point when my mind is not here and I cannot you know understand that of what I'm doing. Right, yeah. um, we believe that yes, we believe that mind is really important in a, uh, you know instrument playing and uh, the reason that uh, we always say uh, we have to uh, practice for a limited of time is that uh, for example, when uh, the time that we are practicing uh, goes uh, after for, uh, goes more than for example two or three hours, our mind is not processing that the uh, no the amount of information that our mind is receiving is too much and there is no time for processing. So uh, we cannot understand what we are doing. And we are just uh, playing the instrument like, a, like for example, I'm just uh, doing this. Okay, what's the point? You know, <laughs> it's exactly the same. And, uh, we do not progress because my mind is not there. I'm absent-minded uh, in yeah. that time. Uh, how do you uh, teach your students how to concentrate during the practice session because it's really important is there any special uh, let's say exercise or is there anything uh, anything that you teach them to do before the practice session yeah this there's there's a couple things i want everybody to consider that is listening right now um so when we're talking about mindfulness and um our mental game right it sounds like a lot um these are two things that we need to work on mindfulness and our mental or mindset are two different things. You can have a really healthy mindset. You can have a really positive outlook on life, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're approaching your life with mindfulness, which is just the ability to be present and open to your surroundings, in my opinion. So for example, it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is mindfulness. 
you're not entering your practice session with a goal in mind. Number one, if you don't have a goal with any type of practice session, you're simply, I hate to be like this blunt, but in a way, if you're trying to be a professional musician or you are a professional musician, unless you're approaching that practice session with, I'm going to noodle around for 20 minutes, you are essentially wasting a practice session and you're wasting your time because you're not going anywhere. But if you go into the practice session and say, hey, I'm gonna have fun for 20 minutes, I'm gonna noodle around, then fantastic, you have a goal to have fun. And when you do that, you can let go and you can approach that goal with a little bit of focus. But if we don't know where we're going, if we don't have a destination, how are you gonna get there? You can't, right? So it's really yes. important yes. to know where we're going. And when you know where you're going, you, your brain and your subconscious already starts to formulate these ideas on how to get there, whether we know how to get there or not. And that goes along. Um, the second thing is mindfulness, right? Um, daily meditation is so, so important. I struggle with ADHD and that is something um, my grandpa also struggles with. So when you have ADHD, when you're practicing, uh, it can be an Achilles heel because you can be practicing a lick and then all of a sudden you can be like, number one, I'm bored. Number two, squirrel. Or number three, you just you, your brain just keeps going in a thousand different directions. So that's why incorporating some type of meditation into your daily practice is essential. And if I know my clients are struggling with focusing, struggling with mindfulness or struggling with their mindset, the first thing I have them do is I have them meditate a little bit. And, you know, even a week or two, they start to say like, oh, my mind starts to feel a little bit more clear. I have a little bit more focus for about 45 minutes to an hour um, of practice, which if you're a trombone player, I don't, I would argue you don't want to practice past that point anyway in a given practice session. But um, mindfulness and meditation, there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies that show the benefits of it. I mean, not doing meditation um, is something that ultimately is holding you back from being your best self. And there are plenty of free resources out there. Everybody check out the Bulletproof Musician. The Bulletproof Musician posts um, uh, psychology related uh, research and compares it to how we can apply it to our lives as musicians, especially in our practice, our performance, and just our daily life. So I would highly recommend everybody to check that resource out. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of articles and research studies in there. And I just want to throw out that if we don't have the ability to focus, if we don't have the ability to shut off um, our default mode network, which is essentially like having 30 apps open on your phone, if we don't have the ability to just swipe up on those apps and just clear them out of our head, uh, then we, you know, we're not going to be able to focus as much as we can. We're not going to be able to live in the present and we're not going to be able to approach our environments with this open mindfulness that we want to try um, to accomplish, that we want to try to live in. Yes. Uh, just, if, uh, just before continuing, I, I thought that I uh, was your picture. Uh, I think we are uh, reaching the limited time of Instagram for the live show. Uh, I'm going to stop the live and uh, ask you to join us again, okay? I'm going to okay. save this one uh, in a couple of, it, I think it takes one minute. It's okay. I'm going to ask okay. you again to join us. See you again. خب من لایو رو قطع میکنم داریم به تایمی یک ساعت میرسیم لایو قطع میکنم و مجدد لایو رو شروع میکنم و از این درخواست میکنم که اون اضافه بشه.